you, Jackie, and uh, the foundation for inviting me. Um, yeah, so it's uh, Green Therapeutics is a recently established uh, company. We started in September last year, and it's focused in on developing uh, radipril. And radipril is a candidate molecule in clinical stage. is a targeting a uh, population of patients with the gain of function mutation on the green 2 b gene, the code for the NR2B subunit of the NMDA receptor, where the drugs actually binds and exert its uh, inhibitory effect. We are about to start clinical study in this indication. Uh, I'm gonna provide you a little bit of background on the molecule, on the patient populations, and uh, you know, a few elements of the design that we are about to start. Um, so radipril, as I said, it's a clinical stage molecule. It's been in the clinic uh, before for the previous indications. It's a quite selective uh, molecule to the NR2B subunit. And, um, you know, one important feature you see on the second bullet is uh, the quite differentiating from the other molecules that have a similar mechanism of action is that it retains its inhibitory effect at the receptor uh, coded by the gain of function mutation. And I'll show you some data on that. Um, has been profiled in a number of uh, seizure and epilepsy model that you see it listed there. We have, as I said, in vitro data on, uh, on mutations, the carriers, and, uh, and we have a, a safety database of uh, over 400 patients and healthy individuals. They were exposed to the drug under the previous sponsor for uh, other indication and it was neuropathic pain where the drug showed no effect and but uh, nevertheless was uh, safe and uh, tolerated. There have also been uh, three infants uh, with infantized pass exposed to the drug and I'll show you briefly the data. And uh, you know, in essence, the drug is a good uh, safety package and uh, good preclinical toxicology. Uh, there's no cytochrome dependence so we don't expect to see drug-drug interaction. And uh, as I said, we are about to start the study in this uh, specific uh, genetically defined population. Um, so the few things about this uh, condition, a green to be uh, related disorder has been recently described. So there are, you know, hundreds of patients describing the literature. Um, we don't have epidemiological study as often the case with this newly described condition. Uh, we have uh, an expected, uh, uh, you know, incidence based on the mutation rate of the gene that you listed, uh, you see listed there. And, um, and you know, what is making this uh, attractive apart from the mechanism of action of the drug and uh, is the fact that uh, there is a quite an established uh, scientific community and also patient advocacy that have produced enormous amount of data on the disorder. Uh, we know quite a number of details on the uh, characteristic of uh, the, the mutations, the functional effect, where they reside. And you see there, you know, this LOF and loss of function mutation are also described, but gain of function mutation, they're more uh, residing on the pore of the receptor. And that's, I will explain you the, the reason why make radiopathy more attractive. And, uh, and there are databases of patients where we have all the characteristic of the genetic uh, mutations, uh, the functional effect and the, and the phenotypic characteristic. These patients are, you know, typical, you know, infant onset uh, syndrome with a number of uh, uh, symptom symptoms uh, like a developmental delay, of course, epilepsy with seizures, uh, quite a number of behavioral dis disorders, so sometimes uh, up to the, you know, being diagnosed with autism. They have a self injurious behavior, tantrums, a number of really, uh, you know, impairing conditions. And because of the mechanism of action that, you know, of the drug that target the underlying, path, uh, you know, etiology, uh, we expect to see an effect on, on most of the symptoms. Well, all the symptoms, but of course, some of the symptoms can be measured more easily. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute uh, what we are going to be doing in the study. So there is a great resource and uh, patient advocacy also that, you know, they, they're helping us in the design and the conduct of the study. This was one of the reasons really that we, we, we consider investing in this indication. Uh, so this is like a piece of data in vitro that I, I show you that characterize the molecule and differentiate versus a non-selective NMDA antagonist at memantine uh, or other, you know, like a ketamine or other uh, compounds that as a non-selective uh, binding. So you, have, you see now this uh, on the left side, the concentration response curve uh, with different lines and different colors. And uh, those include uh, three different mutations with gain of function and also the wild type. 
And what the data on the left side shows is that Reliprodil maintains its affinity even in the presence of this, uh, these mutations. On the contrary, if you look at the right side, uh, there you see memantine and you see that it lose affinity you know, with a one specific mutation. You see the black line that is quite moved and there is a shift on the potency. So basically lose potency and affinity. Memantine and it's quite erratic and depending on the mutations, you know, it's, it's very, it's very uh, different. Uh, so the drug reliprodil retain is, is property because most of the gain of function mutation, I would say the vast majority, if not the totality, reside on the pore region where the memantine binds, uh, why reliprodil binds in this allosteric site that is remote from the, 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 where the, the, the mutation resides. So for this reason, we believe that we will have a, a much more potent, you know, if, uh, it's much more potent with memantine, it's not affected by the mutation. And so it uh, should have its effect on all uh, mutation carriers with gain of function. Um, this is like uh, the mutation that they initially described in the 2014 uh, were only three patients existing. So of course there were no uh, chance to do a clinical trial on those patients and the, the mutations were described on, on patients with infantile spasm. And because of that, and because of the NMDA and glutamate hypothesis on uh, infantile spasm, the previous sponsor conducted this study in three infants with infantile spasm that, of course, were treatment resistant. And, uh, you know, only three patients open label, so I'm not going to make that much out of this, uh, but, you know, there are important, you know, takeaways that help us in the current development. So, first of all, the drug was safe and tolerated. We have a, a good understanding on the PK in infants. Uh, and, uh, you know, it shows also an effect in, uh, on this on this spasm seizures and one patient became uh, spasm free, the other had a reduction on the spasm frequency. Quite remarkable. Uh, that this was a typical study for infantile spasm, two weeks of duration. You know, primary endpoint was uh, to seizure and freedom. Um, again, I don't want to make too much about the efficacy, but you know, clearly encouraging data and support uh, our our pediatric uh, program. Um, this is the outline of the study. Uh, it's, um, it's phase one B, so the primary endpoint is safety and tolerability and PK. We will have an individualized titration over a four week uh, period up to a dose that we would consider the, 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 the maximum uh, dose that uh, and uh, currently, but that will be the primary goal to see which doses will be tolerated in this population. And, uh, and then of course, we'll have a maintenance period of eight weeks and where we will be measuring an effect on seizure, but not only on seizure, but also on behavior, on sleep and, uh, and uh, on motor function that is quite impaired in this patient. Uh, you know, as I said, you know, we expected to see an effect on overall symptomatology because of uh, the magnitude of action. And, uh, you know, we will include, of course, uh, you know, global scales as, uh, you know, CGI and uh, uh, caregiver burden. Um, now, I talk about green to be, and now just to show you briefly, the, the NMDA receptor is co-assembled with other subunits, and uh, those subunits harbor also mutations and the gain of function mutation as well. And uh, because of the data that uh, I'll describe in a minute, uh, we expect Redipri to have an effect also on the carriers of the mutation in these other subunits. Those are patients that uh, they have a very similar symptomatology, you know, that epilepsy is the second more common feature. Green to eight is the most frequent uh, subset of patients. And, um, you know, this half of, of the NMDA receptor are three heteromeric uh, in the brain. And so it means that the 2A and 2B are co-expressed in the same receptor. So the inhibitory effect of radiprodil in this uh, construct is expected to, to, you know, to mitigate the overactive uh, 2A um, subunits. And there are data in vitro that have been published showing that uh, radiprodil in fact uh, retain its inhibitory effect on the 2A gain of function mutations. And there are also data in vitro in the 2A uh, mouse model uh, where radiprodil show increase uh, on survival and also a similar mechanism and MD antagonist uh, block seizure in the adogenic seizure model with the 2A gain of function mutations. And 2A, there are animal models. We don't have 2B uh, suitable to uh, animal models. And uh, we are currently testing radiprodil on this adogenic seizure model. But as I said, the other NMDA blocker block the seizure in this model. So for this you know, evidence that I show you, we believe that there will be an effect also on the other uh, green 2 uh, subtype and 2A, 2D as well, and green 1. And uh, we will be expanding 
the study very soon to this uh, other subset of patients. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. The study is about to start. Uh, anybody interested, then of course, uh, please contact us. And uh, you know, thanks again for your, your time. attention.